listen, I'm looking forward now to hearing Pastor John. Howdy, 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 howdy. Don't you love it? Yeah, and uh, the cool thing is, uh, he has this tendency that whatever you give, he blesses. Which I kind of like, because if you're like me, there have been times in my life when I sort of checked out what I was offering to the Lord and realized it ain't much. It's just not much. But the confidence that we've got a daddy who can take anything we offer and he can turn it into something absolutely marvelous. It's a great story. It's not one that's told this morning just to rip you off or to fleece the flock or, or just to try to get more money in this thing. It's a principle to live by. It's a basic principle to live by because when you leave the house today, you still got your journey out here. You got your kids, you got your family, you got your friends, you got bills, you got stuff that you have to deal with every day. It's a principle to live by, that if we'll take what we have, yield it to the Lord, he will make it enough to take care of everything we have to deal with. It's a good principle, right? Right. Okay, guys, um, <clears throat> I've been given this incredible opportunity to do what you really can't do uh, this morning. And uh, in, in an effort and opportunity to try to share with you the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. What I can do is biblically lay out for you some things and then encourage you in your walk with him to be open to the Lordship of Jesus so that in your relationship with him, as you're open, you will discover who the Holy Spirit really is in your life. And over the years that I've had both in mainline denominational experience as a, a pastor and as an evangelist, uh, and as I've had that experience in non-denoms everywhere as well, I don't know that I have ever seen less understanding about any issue in the walk that we have than I have seen in terms of the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Which is in many ways so tragic because it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit that we're able to make this journey. And so sometimes we get into this intellectual thing where we've got to understand it. Let me tell you something. I preach a lot of stuff I don't understand. But you know why I preach it? Because it's in the book. And if it's in the book, it's the, the bottom line of truth for me. So I'm going to preach it. And some folks will say, well, do you understand it? I'll say, I don't know. But what I know is it's true. And I'm going to keep preaching it till it becomes reality for me. And what I'm trying to get across to you early in my little time with you is, hey, you're not going to make this journey with Jesus back to the house without the person in power of the Holy Spirit active in your life. So I'm going to read a passage of Scripture. Then I will figure out what I'm doing because the truth of the matter is I did this at 8 o'clock and I still don't know exactly what I did. But let me read this for you out of Acts chapter 1, beginning here with verse 4. On one occasion while he was eating with them, being his disciples, like to have sat in on some of these dinners with Jesus. <laughs> yeah, I tell you, one of the dinners that fascinates me was the time that he went to the house of Simon the leper. And this is after the leper had been, you know, cleansed and this kind of thing. Uh, then he went to Lazarus when they were at Lazarus' house after he'd been raised from the dead. Uh, don't you think it's kind of cool? to be able to sit down with a dead dude that ain't dead anymore and with Jesus who raised him from the dead. Would that not be a cool dinner? You know, I really think, had I been invited to the dinner, I, I know I, I would love Jesus and really be fascinated with him, but I'd have one eye on the dead dude <laughs> that was no longer dead. Isn't it amazing what the power of God will do through this man Jesus? But what we discover is 
Jesus telling us in John 14 that the ministry that he did, the works that he did, will do. If we have faith in him, by that, we will do the things that he did. Raise the dead, heal the sick, set the captives free, bind up the brokenhearted. Is that not wild that we've been given that opportunity to participate in this kind of ministry? Amazing. Chapter 1, beginning here with verse 4. On one occasion while he was eating, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about, meaning that this thing about the Holy Spirit is not news to these guys, that Jesus has talked to them about the person of the Holy Spirit, the need for the Holy Spirit, what would be happening when the Holy Spirit came, and really, now, he's trying to put them in touch with how this event that we call Pentecost is going to take place. So he says, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Uh, These guys were kind of like you and me. Jesus could tell them something that was pretty clear and they'd get it messed up. Have you ever heard some stuff about Jesus and you jumped on it and found out later you just missed it? Or maybe you had some friends like I've had who will come and tell me you missed it, that you didn't really understand what Jesus was saying. But it's really kind of cool that Jesus never discarded these guys simply because they missed it. Verse 7. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, part of this story here is simply Jesus is saying, if you will obey me, I will equip you for the work that I'm calling you to. One of the things in in my journey with the Lord that I've been able to get in touch with is the reality that I don't know everything and that God's not said everything to me he's going to say and that there is a journey that I'm on and the journey leads back to the house so I can spend all eternity with my Father. But while I am in this realm as I walk in obedience, according to Jesus, the very things he did, I'll be able to do. Now, as strange as really that may sound when we get down to the nitty-gritty with it and plug into it and believe it, it's true. And what Jesus was really talking about was, if you will have faith in me, And if you will yield yourself to my authority as Lord of your life, then in that yieldedness, the power of the Holy Spirit will be released in your life and you will be able to do these things. But in our humanity, sometimes, we jump on the things that we think can happen or are going to happen and we miss what it takes to get there. I don't know uh, where you've come from in your, your church background, but my initial development, whatever it looked like at different times, very stunted in terms of my growth, but my early growth was in the United Methodist Church, uh, which I love and appreciate, because the Methodist Church years ago was born out of a move of the Holy Spirit in England. Sometimes I think the church in America has forgotten that. And don't take that as a slap at the Methodist Church because I was saved in the Methodist Church, got baptized in the Holy Spirit in the Methodist Church, and have great friends there. But I'm telling you, 
Whenever we forget where we started and move away from what God has given us, sometimes we end up forgetting that it ever was or that it ever happened. So that part of what's happening for us here at Liberty right now is a pastor Scott, I think, in the leadership fields, that we just want to make sure that as the people who call Liberty home, that we want to make sure that we all really understand who the person of the Holy Spirit is and, and what a relationship with him looks like. You know, I say Father, God's Father. He's Father to me. You know, I was talking to Ross before the service that my, my father, birth father, was killed overseas in World War II. And the man who was going to be my stepfather was killed in Korea. So I had this need for a father. But when I met Jesus and the Holy Spirit introduced me to God as my father, it took a, a place in my heart and filled it up with love in a way that I'd never experienced. So when I say father, I understand father. Because we can relate that to an earthly expression of what a father is. We can get in touch with the idea of Jesus as a man who's God but came to live with us and died for us, but he walked in this realm so we can understand him in that kind of relationship, a physical relation. We get that. So we can identify him as one that we can have a relationship with. Our problem has often come with this idea of the Holy Spirit. The, many people sort of treat the Holy Spirit like he's some weird spirit that floats in and out and makes people do weird stuff. I, I really kind of prefer, and I know there are many people who don't agree with me, which is quite all right. I know a lot of people who insist on being wrong most of their lives. I just <laughs> messing with you a little bit there. But I really prefer the term Holy Ghost. And part of the reason I do is that that phrase, Holy Ghost, is really an old English term that really means holy guest. Holy guest. And this idea that somehow having been born again through the Spirit of God, by the power of the Spirit, that we have become the tabernacle, you and I, the dwelling place, if you will. And Colossians 2, 9 and 10 tells us that in him, Jesus, there is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, meaning the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That when we receive by faith Jesus and are born again, that the Father takes up residence within us. Jesus takes up residence within us. And the Holy Spirit takes up residence within us. And you hear Paul saying, hey, you've got this treasure in earthen vessels. Now, I don't know about you, but when I want to talk to my daddy, I sort of have to work with this thing, because if I'd have been him, I wouldn't have put him in me. You know what I mean? Have you ever looked in the mirror and said, if this is the dwelling place of God, we need to talk? <laughs> but the Godhead living within us means that we have the person of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And people will run around and say, you know, uh, have you gotten the Holy Ghost? When do you get the Holy Ghost? I'm saying, hey, excuse me, just a minute. The book says that when I faith, my faith believed on Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit took up residence. And we, so that the question is no longer, do you have the Holy Spirit? If you've been saved, he's in you. But the issue is, do you have him or does he have you? That's the issue. Because, see, this whole journey that you and I are on, it's really cool that God would look at us, look at our mess, and save us through the blood of Jesus. You don't want to miss that. The alternative is not cool. Good thing that he's done for us, marvelous, miraculous thing he's done for us. But he didn't save us and kill us. He saved us that we might be instruments of his grace and love. In other words, as was told to these young folk when they came up here, both the young ones and the older ones, that God's got a plan for your life. He's got things for you to do. 
You weren't randomly or accidentally birthed. You're in time on time. And God's got a plan for your life. Now, the enemy's effort is to take that plan and disrupt it and distract you with all kinds of things. But God's plan for you does not change. And he has put within you and with me, inside of each of us, the power to be victorious, the power to overcome, the power to live a life that declares the goodness of God, the power to live a life regardless of the circumstances that will enable us to be overcomers, but even more than overcomers, enable us to be those who conquer in the power of God. So you're special. I have to tell you that because I feel special. <laughs> so I don't want to be no one special, but the truth of the matter is, we are all special. Because he had a plan for us, he birthed us, created us, and he's given us the power to live out the journey that he's launched us on. The problem then comes for many of us in terms of the person of the Holy Spirit is that we never really think about cultivating a relationship with him. So that we will talk a lot about Jesus, we'll talk a lot about the Father, and we can understand, but then when we start talking about the Holy Spirit, for some people that's just kind of not comfortable because they don't know how to define that in terms of a relationship. Let me just tell you something in passing. The Holy Spirit loves Jesus. Now Jesus, in coming into this realm, we know he loves his daddy. We know that, don't we? Shake your head and look spiritual. Don't You do know that, don't you? Jesus loves his daddy. Now, we can understand then that there's a relationship here between the Father and the Son. And Jesus says very clearly in the book that everything he does is in line with what the Father says do. In fact, he goes so far as to say, I don't do anything that I haven't heard the Father say do. I don't go unless he says go. I don't stay unless he says stay. Whatever my daddy says, that's what I do. His life was built on this relationship that was embedded in obedience, that he wanted to obey the Father in all things. That's the relationship. But Jesus also came as a revelation of the nature of the Father so that he could say, if you know me, you know the Father. So in their relationship, there is this revelation that teaches us what the nature of our Father really is. Y'all all right? But Jesus, in addition to coming to reveal the nature of the Father, also came to impart to us the promise of the Father. And the promise was, that he was going to provide the Holy Spirit and pour it out on all flesh. And that when we hear those words out of the prophet Joel that simply says that in the latter day, God is going to pour out his Spirit on all flesh. That at the day of Pentecost, which is this Sunday that we celebrate, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out on all flesh. And in that day that your sons and daughters are going to prophesy and young men are going to see visions and old people like me are going to have dreams because of the Holy Spirit being poured out. That would enable me at whatever place I am in the journey, whatever age I happen to be in the journey, that he will supply for me through the Holy Spirit the power that I need, the wisdom that I need, the guidance that I need, the teaching that I need. Whatever it is I need, if I will obey what God says, the Holy Spirit will equip me then to see that through and it can get accomplished not in my strength but in his power. There absolutely needs to be a return to an awareness of and an experience of and a release of the power of God in the lives of churches in America. And if we don't get in touch with that and embrace that, celebrate that, I'm telling you, this nation is headed down a track that it won't come back from. 
But if the people of God will get in touch with the person of the Holy Spirit so that he will equip and empower us, we can be those people who don't just lip service stuff out here, but we can be those people that God empowers to radically transform our society. Not in our strength, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus and the Holy Spirit have this relationship. Here's the deal. Jesus loves his daddy. Holy Spirit loves Jesus. If you want to see the Holy Spirit move in your life, fall in love with Jesus. If you want to see the gifts of the Spirit manifested in your life, obey Jesus. If you really want to see the miracles take place in your life now, in your home, in your community, in your church, obey Jesus. Because when you obey Jesus, the Holy Ghost says, that's my man. I love him. And when you really fall in love with him and obey him, there is this release of the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are things that you and I don't understand about God, things we don't understand about Jesus, things we don't understand about the Holy Spirit, because the book simply says there are mysteries. And God's willing to help us understand some of them, but there's some mysteries, the book says, God keeps only to himself. So if you think somebody as limited as I am is going to have all the answers about who the Holy Spirit is and how he does what he does, it ain't happening. Because there are some mysteries that are a part of this walk that we have. But there is enough revelation that we've been given that if we will by faith believe, submit, and be obedient to Jesus, we will become that vessel through which that river of life flows in miraculous ways. And as I was talking to one sister this morning, that not only out of John, say, John 7, verses 38 39, where we are simply told that if we will by faith believe on Jesus, out of our innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And then John adds there, this he spoke concerning the Holy Spirit, that we will have this river that flows if we by faith will obey, believe in Jesus and obey. But we know based on that that the Holy Spirit within us really wants to flow through us. And as I was talking to my sister, not only that there is this flow that comes when we obey that allows us to be instruments that change lives where we can see miraculous things. Not only do we have it, but there is also that anointing that comes from God for the moment that will radically transform us as it transforms other people. So what I'm trying to say to you this morning, guys, I do not have all the answers, but I will tell you this. His name's Jesus. And if you want the Holy Spirit to move in your life, he's the man you need to see. When we talk about terms, we use the term baptized in the Holy Spirit. When I hear that term, I relate to a lot of people who have different understandings. But this is what I understand. When you obey, there is this flow. And this flow then enables you to be one who may speak in another language, may speak in an unknown tongue, may pray for the sick and they be healed, may be used to deliver those who are in prison. That's not your job. Your job is to obey it's the Holy Spirit's job to do his thing. We get into trouble when we want to capture this and get it done ourselves. What that does, it takes us right back to where we were before we had this experience with him to start with. Now, to be spirit-filled, according to Scripture, is to be a continuous thing. You're not supposed to be a one-trick pony with this deal. You don't just have this experience and all of a sudden, now you got it. But it is a continuous flow as you continue to yield. 
Scripture says that should be the way we live. Haven't you found yourself at a place where you know you love Jesus, you know you've been obedient, you know you've experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit, however you define that and use terminology with it. Basically, it means you yielded, said yes, he did his thing, and filled you to overflowing. It's tied to lordship. It's tied to lordship. You can read John 15. We have this thing about the Father having a vineyard. And then he's got branches here on the, on, on the vine. And as long as that branch stays attached to the vine, then there is a flow into the branch that produces life. You all right? The sap, right? Sap comes up, right? Hello. Fruit tree, right? Huh? Fruit tree. Sap comes up through the trunk of this dude, goes out into the branch, right? And as long as there's the sap flowing, it produces fruit, right? But when that branch gets taken off and there's no flow of the sap, there ain't no fruit. But in your life and my life, as we stay attached to him who is the true vine and we yield to him, then there is that flow of the Holy Spirit like the sap. And there is fruit that gets produced through our life. But when we don't obey, it cuts off the flow. But if you really want the fruit, if you want the gifts manifested in your life, you go back to where you got off the bus in a disobedience, and you say, excuse me, God, I really messed this deal up. And then you get back in and obey, and then you start the flow again. Y'all hanging out with me now? I'm about done. And let me tell you this. I tried doing ministry in my own strength. I tried pastoring churches based on my personality. I thought with my personality, sweet as I am, loving and accepting as I am, who would have a problem with that? <laughs> Takes about three weeks in a new congregation and you find out who's got a problem with that. <laughs> so that I found myself trying to pastor in my own strength. But then found myself in this church that was loaded with Marines and their families. Loaded with all kinds of things happening that were not cool. Things that got beyond my skill set and overwhelmed me and made me at times say, oh my God. I can't believe people live like this. Until I was worn out, frustrated, and depressed. Saved. But worn out and depressed. Treasure in this vessel. Bound for heaven, going to miss hell. But getting my brains beat out. My heart broken looking at the pain people were going through and being able to do nothing about it. And then one day this lady showed up at my door in an afternoon and knocked on my door. And she, when I opened it, she's just a little white-haired lady. I think she might be a little younger than I am now. But she looked old that day. <laughs> and she also had been the one person in that congregation that was getting on my last nerve. Because she always walked around with this thing like, I know something you don't know, and I'm so peaceful and you're so messed up. Every now and then I wanted to catch her and knock her right on the head, but I knew enough to know you don't do old ladies like that. <laughs> she shows up at my door, and I open it. She looks at me and says, I've been praying for you. And I'm thinking, duh. I mean, that's obvious. And she said, I have something to say to you. Can I come in? And I said, well, yeah. So she came in, and her question was very simple. She said, do you know anything about the Holy Spirit? Well, listen, I'm, I'm a, I mean, I know I may sound like an idiot, but I, I did go to seminary, one of which I don't like to talk about, the other one I graduated from. 
The first one is that school in Durham. Uh, and I just hesitate to tell people I even went there. But so I finished, and I graduated. I did flunk my senior sermon. I really did. Uh, so I went back and rewrote it to please the person that flunked me, so they passed me. You can do a lot of stuff if you're just trying to please people. But at any rate, what she said to me was, do you know anything about the Holy Spirit? So I told her what I knew. And I went through the book, and I quoted her the scriptures. I talked about the Spirit of God hovering over this vast thing in Genesis as though to give birth to something. I even knew that that passage there in Genesis what was a Hebrew word picture huh, of a big bird hovering its over, over its nest as though to give birth to something. I knew that. I went on through the book. I probably quoted that passage from John 7 to her. Then I got into Paul and talked about walking in the Spirit, living in the Spirit. I went through it. And when I finished, she looked at me and said, I don't think you do. <laughs> now, this is not a fun moment in your life. You're already depressed. You ain't happy. And you got some lady standing there telling you you don't know nothing about the Holy Ghost. So she left. I uh, made my mind up that I was going back to the book. And I was going to read every reference in the scripture to Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ, Holy Spirit, whatever. I did that for two weeks. Then I got down on my face in my study because I didn't know that I was any further in my understanding than when I started. So I got down on my face in my study and I gave Jesus his church back. And he said, thank you. I gave him my life back and said, really, living or dying, I'm yours. To the best of my ability, whatever you would have me to do, I'm going to obey. And in those moments when I mess it up, I know you're still there. Convict me and I'll, I'll confess and repent. I made this kind of, if, I don't know what to call it, an intersection or an interjection or just a happening, but in that moment, Jesus and I came together. And for the first time in my life, he was the Lord of my life. And as I yielded and submitted, I came to know what people over the years have called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. For me, it was an absolute reality in terms of what happened because my life changed radically. What it really was for me was that I had opened that floodgate so that the flow of the Holy Spirit could do in my life and through my life what pleased God rather than what pleased Johnny. Radically changed my life. Within weeks after that experience, I had a young Marine killed in a helicopter crash. And uh, as a pastor, I was going to go over and try to minister to the family. I went, and I stood around that house for over an hour, felt absolutely, totally inadequate as to what I could do to help this family. Finally, I left the house, went out, sat down in my car, and threw my head across the steering wheel and wept like a baby felt inadequate. Within just a little bit of time with God, though, and not that long after that experience, I had another helicopter crash in Okinawa where two young Marines were killed. But this time, I had gotten aware of who it was that was on the inside of me and aware of my own inadequacies but of his strength. And before I left my office to go to that house to do ministry, I knew what God was going to do before I got there. Because as I yielded, he ministered. He ministered peace and comfort and strength. He spoke words I wouldn't know. Radically changed my life. Radically changed ministry for me. 
from that to this, I'm telling you guys, over some 40 years. It breaks my heart when I see people who've been saved but are getting their brains beat out every day because they don't know how to submit and yield and release so that they don't know what the fullness of the Holy Spirit's all about. They don't know that they can be refilled every day. They don't understand that God is really for them and wants them not only to make it, but to be victorious in the life that they're in. So my prayer is that as we go forward here for the next few weeks and the staff shares about the person of the Holy Spirit, that as a church, as a church, one that God birthed, that we would not be a people ignorant of such things. Wouldn't you hate to live next to somebody who was terminally ill and you had the answer and you never told them? But for us who know the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, not to tell is tragic. And my prayer is that not only will we here at Liberty, we're not talking about doing crazy stuff, you know what I mean? I've been in churches with pew runners that would start at the back, shut their eyes, and run all the way down to the front. I've been in churches where weird and crazy stuff happened. I've got to tell you, that wasn't the Holy Ghost, that was craziness. However, sometimes what the Holy Spirit does that's really Him because we don't understand it, we want to call it craziness. Which means we got to have a little wisdom, you know I me? Mean? But God will give it to us as we ask. And if we commit ourselves to yield to his lordship, be open to the flow of his Holy Spirit, he will equip, fill, overflow, use us, and we will see miraculous, incredible things happen, not only here in our fellowship, but in the community out here. And I want to encourage you this. Please don't ever forget. It has to do with lordship. I had a friend of mine we were, we, yesterday, we, we were out playing golf early yesterday morning, and we were talking about this thing in terms of baptizing the Holy Spirit, spirit-filled, real-filled, and, and this kind of stuff, and that sometimes in our society out here in our churches, people think that if you talk about spirit baptism, being filled with the Spirit, you're talking about two different classes of Christian. You know, one that has the Holy Spirit but doesn't know the fullness, or one that has the fullness or knows the language and is baptized in the Holy Spirit. And you said, no, 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 no. Never two classes of Christian. Just one class. You're either born again or you ain't. But we're talking about how we navigate the journey. Talking about how we obey God. Talking about what God's made at our disposal as the people of God. What he's got for us to do. And, and the place that we can take up in our society where we can bring wisdom to our political system, wisdom to people who are battling diseases, where we can take the gifts of God and share it with people. And if you think I'm just a little jacked up about this, let me tell you, I am. It hurts to watch the church of Jesus Christ in our society limp along like it's power. We are not powerless. We are the people of God, and he equips us to be about his business. Y'all all right? Y'all so kind to let me ramble on for a little bit up here. Uh, and basically, I'm done. Uh, with the exception of a couple things. One, we're going to have communion. After we have communion... Uh, I want you to know that the elders will be up here. There'll be people available to pray with you. If you're at a place in your journey where you may be like I was and you knew Jesus but not yielded and not obedient in places in your life and you feel kind of void there, that this would be your opportunity to simply invite somebody to pray with you. To simply say, hey, this is where I am, will you pray with me? Because they don't have the answer for you, but he is the answer. And if you will get somebody in faith to agree with you, 
I believe firmly in the fullness of the Holy Spirit and the continuous filling of the Holy Spirit. And I don't get hung up on language. I don't care if you call it baptism. I don't care if you call it perfect love. I don't care what you call it. Just get in it because you need it. You all right? You all are good to me. So we're going to serve communion here, which simply means you and I have been given the privilege of being God's people to serve the gifting of God to God's people. And when we celebrate and we offer the bread and the juice, we're giving people an opportunity to come and partake in remembrance of Jesus and, and, and coming to partake of his body and his blood. He tells us that we need to do this in remembrance of him. But I want to tell you that I have seen more healings take place at the celebration of communion than I have in all the healing services I've been in. There's just something about coming to the table and knowing that the real presence of the Lord is going to meet you here. So these are elements that represent his body and his blood. And I'm just going to offer those to the Lord that they would be consecrated and uh, that you would receive and then we would open up an opportunity for prayer. So the way we're going to do it is they're here. I invite you to come. There's a table over here. Uh, that has, uh, it is, uh, I don't see it over there now. Who's got it? You got it. Okay, on this end over here, if you have allergies, this will be the place to go and get them healed. And uh, it's, it's gluten-free, whatever that is. And if you have allergies, these are the two folks you need to see over here. Okay? So, Father, we just lift these to you right now that the blood of Jesus, the body of Jesus that's been given to us, Lord. We offer these back to you that you would consecrate them to us, that by faith, as we receive the bread, it will become the body of Christ to us, and that the juice would become the blood of Jesus to us by faith. And so, Lord, we come in faith to receive, and we pray. And we thank you. Amen. So we invite you to come. And after you uh, have communion, as you go back to your table, remember there will be people here to pray for those of you who like prayer. But I'd like you to stay for just a moment before you leave after we celebrate communion. And then we'll pray for those who want to be prayed for and we'll release you. But please hang together for just a minute for me after that. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Just keep coming. There are folks standing to serve you. And uh, if you wouldn't mind, if you just return to your seat for a minute after you receive the elements, we'd appreciate that.
really neat this morning to have this many of our high schoolers over here. We're here to celebrate with us every Sunday. Very cool. Thank you guys for serving. Thank you for partaking this morning. And uh, thank you for remaining just a minute. I wanted to do something. We, uh, there's a passage of scripture that obviously are all good to me. Uh, but there's some that is kind of close to my heart because we seem to ignore them a little bit in the body of Christ. But scripture says that when one member of the body is honored, the whole body is honored. And I think we need to do a little more of that to understand that we're not just lifting a person up to celebrate how just how important they are, but we're honoring one another. So this morning, I want to just take a moment to honor Faye Nelson. Um, uh, part of it is simply um, she's uh, getting three quarters of the <laughs> three quarters of the century here today. Um, that she wouldn't necessarily want to tell you about, but I think it just sort of came out, you know what I mean? And uh, since we're great friends and I'm older than she is, it's, uh, it's a good thing. But one of the reasons I wanted to do that is not only to say happy birthday, Faith, but to say to you guys, uh, my son, who is our lead pastor here, would not be where he is without the investment that Faye and Cliff Ann uh, poured into Scott, because he traveled with them for about 10 years in the summer doing puppets, and they disciple them, and uh, you can see so much of their heart and his heart that's played out in Scott, and I just wanted to say thank you for that, and we've got some flowers somewhere. I'm not sure if somebody let a deer in the house and he ate them, or uh, you're doing what? You already gave them to her. All right, well then, enjoy. All right, and uh, And we don't want to, we really don't want you to leave the house today um, without having the opportunity to have somebody pray with you uh, for the fullness of the Holy Spirit in your life, for that, that nudge just to be obedient to His Lordship so that the Holy Spirit can have freedom in your life. If you're at a place where you've been struggling like maybe I was, uh, trying to do ministry in my own strength, trying to be a father, which I knew nothing about, trying to be a good husband, knew nothing about that. But it wasn't until I made that decision to give him that access that I learned how to be a father and learned how to be a good husband. And if any of you are here struggling with that, we've got people here that are going to be available to pray for you. Please take advantage of this opportunity uh, and, and just put that before somebody to let them agree with you in prayer. So if I've got the elders and the prayer team, if you guys would come on up. And then for those of you who've done business with
the Lord and you feel like it's time to depart, uh, please, we want to release you to do that. Uh, but if you don't mind, you can do it just quietly while we invite people down for prayer. So if you just stand, if you would, and those of you who would like to have prayer, we invite you to come down and be open to what God's got for you here today. Have a great week. Be blessed. Go tell somebody about Jesus and let them know that the Holy Spirit is real and he's good about this stuff. Go and have a great week.